Hey guys, how are we doing? Welcome to Walking Boxing. It is Saturday, August 31st, 2024, the last day of winter. So officially spring is tomorrow. It's not really looking like spring at the moment, I can tell you that. So this is a bit chilly this morning. Um, a little, still a bit windy, it has been wet. Uh, but that, that is what happens here in the Macedon Ranges or Victoria in general. Uh, all sorts of uh, weather that uh, can hit at any time. So, uh, look, I'd just like to start uh, today's walk by uh, sending my uh, my best wishes and condolences to my good mate, uh, Grant Tazzy Brown. Uh, he lost his beautiful mum this morning after a long illness and uh, must be pretty tough uh, for Tazzy at, at this time. Uh, but again, uh, just sending all uh, love, condolences and best wishes to, to uh, Tazzy Brown and uh, his family in a, in, a, in a very difficult time. So again, all the best. Um, guys, just uh, today, just a little bit more, a little bit all to, to finish off the whole uh, zoo versus Zarafa thing at the moment. I know it's lots been said in the last couple of days and, um, you know, statements made, comments made, accusations made, whatever it is, it's all been made. Um, but uh, it's good to see it's uh, sort of been put to bed. I'm not sure, I haven't, I haven't heard anything else about uh, charges and sanctions and ramifications, all that sort of stuff. I did see that uh, uh, Jeff Fennick um, said that uh, Michael's Rafa's brother should be uh, really sanctioned hard. Now he has been obviously banned for life from No Limit shows, but probably more, more severe penalties because he did cite the example of uh, Hass Hamden, who was given a three-year ban for throwing a water bottle at an amateur event. So, look, while I don't condone that at all, and I think it's pretty childish and silly, uh, three years, um, which has pretty much derailed his professional career. Now, I know you've got to have um, you know, consequences for your actions, I get that, but uh, three years is a, is, a, is a fair bit of a penalty to pay, isn't it? But, uh, so you would think, according to Jeff, in this instance, that if you're using that as a bit of a benchmark, that uh, there might be some other things coming for for uh, Jason Zaraf. And look, at the end of the day, I don't think it's going to mean too much to him. Okay, he can't go to a fight night if it's if it's on a no limit show, but you know, big deal, I suppose, in, in his eyes. But uh, I was just thinking more about the, I suppose the the no limit role in the whole thing with this Zoo Zarafa situation, and I I understand that. You know, they, they probably want to cash out or cash in, whatever you might want to might want to call it, and go for. And I understand I've got my promoter's hat on here, by the way. I understand the way it works, and, I, and so I get it that they want you know, this Nikita Zoo versus Michael Zarafa fight, and it's going to be massive and um, and everything else. But there's probably two or well, uh, a couple of ways to look at it. I think differently that I think would probably work out for all concerned a little bit better than just let's just get it get uh, together for the next fight and again i know you've got to cash in while it's there and everyone's names are in the news and and everything else and and i think michael what is he 32 so i understand that they've got to get things moving but i'm looking at it through a another lens for no limit as far as a, a business the business end goes this is main event as well where with nikita only having 10 fights is there really a rush at the moment just to throw them in together when you could probably get a few more fights out of both and really um, solidify your business a little bit more what i mean by that is let's face it outside uh tim and nikita there is no pay-per-view worthy fighters out there now michael's raf is arguably um maybe worthy I, I don't know maybe as as the b side i don't know but they're a little bit scarce or the, the barrel's a little bit empty when it comes to real guys they can put on the pay-per-views. Now, you've got to remember, they have to do X amount of pay-per-views per year to keep main event happy. So if they just rush into a Nikita Zoo and Michael Zarafa fight right here and now, well, it pretty much eliminates one of those guys. Now, I know there's, there's a possibility that Nikita will, will come back, but look, let's face it, if he loses, um, it's going to be pretty hard to to make him that pay-per-view star that um, that you want him to be, and and why not drag out the Michael Zarafa Association just a little bit more? And what I mean by that, they've got 
I think they've signed a three fight deal and and what or two three fight deal whatever it might be but why why not maybe sign him up to a five fight deal or six fight deal they've got Nikita under their umbrella so why couldn't you continue to match Nikita Zhu in these pay-per-views against these domestic level fighters, the Kyle Mizzoudis of the world I'm talking about? There's other fights uh, he, he could fight out. There's a couple still around for him, but uh, same as for Michael Zarafa. Now, you might think, well, who else is there for Michael Zarafa? Well, there's some really good fights for, for Michael Zarafa. They could really use him as another alternative to their pay-per-view model. And, uh, I know there's possibly the Isaac Harbin rematch. I, I sort of understand that one, but Isaac would need a couple of more fights. I know he's not with No Limit anymore, by the way, but I'm sure he would come back for a Michael Zarafa fight. There's fights like maybe a Joel uh, Camilleri. Not quite sure that's pay-per-view worthy. But then you've got someone like an Andre Mikhailovich, who not only would be uh, a hell of a fight for Michael, but it would be, I think it would be pay-per-view worthy. So what I'm saying is why not just draw it out a little bit longer? Uh, that way you get another three or four fights out of both Nikita and Michael, um, you know, in good pay-per-view events. And with Michael, I know a few of you out there are probably saying, no, everyone hates Michael, there's no way he's going to headline a pay-per-view. But let's say he's in there with a Mikhailovich in a really good fight, and true fight fans would buy that because I know it's a ripper fight. But stack it with the undercard fighters, I think people would pay. I really do. And then, of course, people are going to pay for Nikita no matter what. And then, of course, you've got Tim with the international pay-per-views um, in there as well. So I'm just saying, why not just stretch it out for another three or four fights. Let Nikita get to 14 fights. Maybe he's had 10 now. And then the end result in that fifth fight um, with Michael Zarafa's contract is the payoff with Nikita Zhu versus Michael Zarafa. Because again, I'll say it. It's not like they've got pay-per-view stars, um, you know, just just coming from everywhere. They haven't got a lot apart from the Zoo brothers at the moment, so why not um, make the best of the situation and string it out a little bit longer? Now, of course, there's, there's the risks involved. Uh, one of the fighters might lose. Uh, Mikhailovic certainly wouldn't be an easy fight for Zarafa, and I've got a feeling uh, Isaac Harbin wouldn't be... Uh, would be a handful the second time around. I think he's learned a fair bit since that first fight. So anyway, just my uh, two cents uh, on that. The other bit of uh, Aussie news in the last sort of day or so is uh, George Cambosis. Now, there was talk that he would fight um, William Zapetta. There was uh, rumours that he would fight uh, Zapetta in Saudi Arabia on November 16. There was another fighter in the mix, Tevin Farmer, I think it was, who was thrown in there as maybe as an alternative. And, and it did make a lot of sense at the time. George had been saying for quite some time there was, um, there was a big fight announcement coming. So look out for that. But the, the spanner in the works, I suppose, or the fly in the ointment, whatever you might want to call it, um, has just come out just yesterday where he said that uh, he, a big announcement was coming but it was going to be at 140. Now, obviously, we know that um, George Cambosis uh, hasn't fought at 140 before, but also William Zapetta isn't at 140 uh, at the moment. He's a 135-pounder, and he's looking for a big uh, fight at 135 against uh, Stevenson, Davis, or one of these sorts of guys. So that probably eliminated that. So I'm intrigued to see who the fight's going to be. As I said, I thought the Zapetta fight did make a lot of sense, and uh, that would be it. And, and everyone else is doing these Saudi cards, so why not George? Jump in there while you can and take the money. But... Um, yeah, it's just with that 135 pound um, um, point, it probably eliminates that fight. So yeah, so who is next at 140? And um, good day, mate. And it does good, mate. And it uh, does make sense that um, maybe it is going to be Teofimo Lopez number two because Lopez has been pretty, pretty um, quiet as of late. Hasn't said a lot. Um, normally he does. And sometimes when there's silence, you know that there's there's stuff going on. So I wouldn't be surprised if we see George Cambosis versus Teofimo Lopez too. And if we do, I love the fight. I think it would be great for George. I think it's a perfect fight for him. Little bit, I won't say concerned, but the, the going up to 140 just, just sparks my interest just a little bit because he's never obviously fought there before. He is a uh, smallish 135 pounder. I think Lopez is a really solid 140 pounder. So yeah, I, I don't know, I, t take all that aside. Look, I, what can you say about this guy, George Cambosis? 
I don't know, he divides a lot of people. Uh, a lot of people, um, you know, he's got a lot of fans out there, but he's also got a lot of detractors. Well, I'm certainly not a detractor. I mean, this guy, now, I get it. The first thing people say, well, he's fought these guys, but he hasn't beaten them, and he can't beat the. He's lost his last four fights. But, geez, what other fighter out there in the world at the moment is putting their hands up and saying, whoever they are, the best, I just want them. I don't care. Okay, I've lost my last fight. I don't care. Bring on the next one. There's no, well, I better have two or three, um, you know, nothing fights and, you know, get my, my supporter base up and about again and, and uh, you know, make me feel good about myself and, and create a false reality, I suppose. He's just like, hey, just line them up. The other thing is, of course, he's, he's um, probably on the, the uh, final phase of his career, maybe, maybe. Um, so he just wants to take the best fights he can. But I just, uh, as I said, I know he divides a lot of people, but geez, um, you cannot, even if you're his biggest critic, you cannot fault this guy for taking the best fights. And if it, if it is Tiafimo Lopez, look at his last few fights. Um, Tiafimo uh, Lopez, number one. Devin Haney, one and two. Uh, Maxi Hughes, uh, okay, uh, probably the, the one... Um, uh, asterisks in there and then you've got uh, Lomachenko and then Lopez number two just uh, just crazy this guy so uh, now nah, he's uh, to his word a true Spartan and uh, yeah I uh, fully respect what what uh, George Cambosis is doing and I must admit I wasn't quite sure where he was going to go because at 135 not much there for him now he's just in that really weird uh, situation where He's been at the top, but he's just been stopped for that for that world title fight, and all of a sudden, the, all the other elite 135 pounders and the champions in that division are all just now looking at either each other or um, other contenders, and um, and he doesn't really want to come back to the domestic scene or even to a lower level international scene. So he was really in a difficult situation, and that's why I reckon this Lopez fight makes all the sense in the world. Go up to 140, uh, it's a new challenge. You're fighting an opponent who, you, who you've shown you can get into his head, you've shown you can beat him, more importantly, and it's for another belt at another weight. So um, always reinventing himself is, is George Cambosis. And, and I've always sort of said it along the line that I just don't think this guy gets enough respect uh, here in Australia. I know we always hear about Tim we, and more and more we're hearing about Jai and, and now Liam and that's great. They 100% fully deserve every single thing they get. But I just think sometimes people forget that George Cambosis, you know, went to New York, knocked off a, a top 10 pound for pound fighter in Tiafimo Lopez, defended it twice in Australia against mass, uh, in, uh, in front of massive crowds. You know, even with the the um the or well, that fight with maxi hughes it wasn't overly great um and and let's face it was probably lucky to get out of it come back comes back and fights vasily lomachenko in another uh, record crowd in perth so yeah it's uh it's uh yeah. oh geez they come down this hill pretty fast out uh, here on the, on the bikes uh but yeah just uh yeah full of admiration for for george cambosis and i just think full credit to him and his team for reinventing themselves again and uh, giving themselves an opportunity to be a world champion, if that is the case, by the way. Um, but by all accounts, it is going to be a, uh, a big fight, so let's see what happens there. And just one last thing, uh, you probably know I'm heading off to the canelo Belunga fight uh, next week. And um, I was reading an article this morning, which, which uh, yeah, was really interesting. It was uh, about the, the Canelo event versus the UFC event and, and this, this changing age of boxing. We've just seen it with a card being split, the Better Bivol, uh, Better, sorry, Better Bev but, uh, and Bivol fight. What do I call him? Better Bivol. Uh, Better Bev and Bivol fight. The card's been split. So with the, the broadcasting rights, the main event is on ESPN Plus and the undercard is on the zone. I've never seen that happen before but uh, probably a sign of the time. But it was interesting talking about the, the UFC versus the Canelo event and you know how they compare and, and, and everything else. And it was interesting to see how the, the business goes on uh, behind closed doors. And um, you know they, uh, they reckon actually it was, I think the Sphere, the sphere is that what it's called, it's got 18,000 and Canelo's fight's got, uh, the T-Mobile Arena's got 20,000 people in it. Um, and they reckon both will be packed on the night. But it's amazing that 
it comes down to the properties, the MGM properties, and the amount of tickets they buy, the, how they bankroll the events, and you know they must keep a lot of tickets for and packages for the the high rollers and all that sort of stuff, and how can you know the the UFC and with uh, Turkey Al Sheik involved and sponsoring with the reality season, and it's, it's amazing to think that most of these events are paid for. Um, you know, before they even sell the ticket, you know, by the sponsorship and um, and the uh, everything from the properties and someone like a Riyadh season. So, but uh, it was good, good to see that apparently the the tickets um, have all been at this stage. Both events, by the way, have been heavily discounted, and that's probably no surprise. We saw it with uh, the LA card, the Crawford card, a couple of weeks ago, and and it probably also is a bit of a wake up call to. The powers that be that there's only so much money to go around and a lot of the tickets i think they said the ufc had been uh tickets have been discounted up to 30 percent and i think the canelo fight they have, i think that the most i've seen so far is about 10 percent discounts but they reckon it will get up to about 30 percent in the week or uh, the week leading into the fight and there'll be a lot of tickets given away so Again, with that business side of things, uh, do you think these promoters and everything have got a little bit greedy now? The ticket prices are just uh, just astronomical at the moment. Um, and as I said, there's only so much money to go around. So are we in another curve where, you know, they've come out and, and, and promised all these astronomical purses to these fighters? Is the money there these days to, to fund it? Canelo wants his 50 or 60 million a fight. Um, you know, Turkey Al Sheik is offering uh, uh, amazing amounts of money to his fighters. It's got to come from somewhere. And I know it's easy to say the Saudis have got unlimited dollars, but at some point, the people that are putting those dollars out are still going to be asking questions. And remember, it's not Turkey Al Sheik's money. It's the royal family's money and the government's money. So, yeah, it's, uh, I just found it an interesting read to see how all the little twists and turns go on behind closed doors at a, at a corporate level and how they, how they fill the seats um, and, um, and the packages and the sponsorship and all that sort of stuff goes. But it's, look, it's gonna be a great, a great weekend. I think both fights will be pumping. Um, you know, the Sphere UFC event is obviously a, an amazing event, but uh, this is Canelo Alvarez we're talking about in the Mexican uh, Independence Day long weekend. So I'm sure that'll be packed at the end of the day. And I think a lot of the fans even are onto it at the moment. And, um, a lot of them will probably buy tickets the week of at a 30% discount. So either way, I think it'll be packed. But uh, as I said, an interesting read about all the um, the posturing and pandering and manoeuvring behind closed doors from sponsors and, and um, properties and, and all that sort of stuff. So uh, anyway, guys, that is it for today. Hope you have a, a great weekend. Hope you, hopefully your weather's a little bit better than what it is here in, uh, in Victoria. Uh, but look forward to seeing you tomorrow on Walking Boxing. Have a good one.